They could not keep him in the grave. Happy Easter, everybody. So glad you guys are here. Thanks so much for coming and uh, worshiping with us today. We are thrilled that you're here. If you're joining us online, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today as well. What I want to tell you is that we have over 2,000 years of history on our side. And here's what I mean by that. We've got over 2,000 years of history on our side so that we can see that Easter is a good thing. That we can celebrate he's risen. But if we were able, if we had the ability to travel back in time some 2,000 years ago to the events surrounding Easter in real time, what we would find is it was anything but celebratory. In fact, if anybody was celebrating, evil was celebrating. Evil was rejoicing. There was confusion everywhere. There was doubt everywhere. Because you see, the disciples were there when they crucified Jesus. The disciples were there when they arrested Jesus. The disciples were there when he took his last breath. And so they're convinced it's over. They're convinced he's dead. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been convinced that something was real even though it wasn't? Have you ever been convinced that something was over and it wasn't? Like if your senses, like everything that you've seen, has it believed, has it, has it brought you to believe that, that what you've just seen, what you've just witnessed, it's finally over? Have you ever had that happen before? Have you ever been convinced of that? Because I'm telling you something, the day Jesus Christ was crucified, they were convinced that no Easter was coming. They were convinced it was over. And let me tell you how easy this happens. Because sometimes our senses can trick us into things that aren't real, that things aren't final, or things aren't as they seem would probably be a better way to put that. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, so years ago, this wild guy, never met him, don't even know his name, but he came out with jelly beans. And it's Easter, so we can talk a little bit about jelly beans, I guess. But these were unlike any other jelly beans that have ever been created. Now, if I were to hold them up and if I were to show you, you'd be like, yes, that looks like a jelly bean. And if I were to say, here, you should smell this now, after we got over the weirdness of that whole deal, you would be like, okay, all right, I guess it smells like a jelly bean. If we were to rattle this thing in the bowl, it would sound like a jelly bean. You would, all your senses would be saying, this is a jelly bean. But the jelly bean that this guy created was unlike any other jelly bean before because this one didn't taste like one. It tasted like garbage. In fact, I think that that's really the flavor that these things are. So what do you do when somebody makes a jelly bean like that? You buy it. Because you want to see if anybody's crazy enough to eat that thing. Well, I, w I went and bought these jelly beans. And I put them in this really attractive bowl in my office. And the first guy to come in and see these jelly beans in this really pretty bowl was my cousin. I was so glad it was my cousin. <laughs> And he goes, hey, Mike, can I have some jelly beans? And I was like, man, I wish you would. And he goes, really? I was like, no, have as many as you want. Now, this brother is at least four inches taller than I am, which basically means his mitt is like a grizzly bear. And he put his mitt down in there and brought up a whole mitt full, big old paw full of jelly beans. And when you're that tall and when you're that big, you don't go like this. You go like this. Now, the beauty about the invention was is that the outside coating of this thing tasted good. And so I'm looking at him. I'm like, how are they? He's like, awesome. <laughs> and then he started chewing them. And then something weird happened to his face. He wasn't smiling anymore. It was like, wait a minute. I thought these were jelly beans. What, what are these evil things you have tricked me with? And between the coughing and the gagging, we, we just had a good laugh. The point being, sometimes things are not as they seem, even though we were convinced they are. The disciples around Easter, though they saw, they were not as they seemed. In fact, again, just to prove how easy it is, this past week we were taking my, uh, actually it was not this week because that would have been spring break. It would have been the week before. We are dropping my seven-year-old off at school, and he loves gum. When mom gets gum out, he wants gum. So what do you do? You give him gum. And so before he gets out, uh, Shaney says, hey, Gabe, go ahead and spit the gum out. He goes, I will not. I'm going to swallow the gum. Listen to what she told him. 
if you swallow that gum, it'll take seven years to digest. You've heard that before. Listen, somebody told my wife back in the day that if you swallow a piece of gum, seven years, it'll be in your stomach. And she told him that. I said, don't you tell that boy that. She goes, no, it's true. I said, no, it's not. She goes, yes, it is. She was convinced. I'm like, no, it's not. She's like, well, how come you're so convinced? I said, listen, I have chewed a whole lot of gum in my life, and I have swallowed a lot of gum in my life. If that were true, I would be bringing new meaning to the term hubba bubba right now because I've had a lot of that gum. And she goes, okay, Gabe, you can swallow it. Boom, down the hatch it goes. Now, Those things don't really matter, whether that's true or whether that's not true. But see, today, during our time together, I'm going to share some thoughts about Easter that I believe we're all going to be able to see ourselves in. And what I know is, is that there is a group of folks who showed up today, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You believe that he rose from the dead When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, nobody comes to the, except through me, you're convinced that is real. But I also know that today, there's a group of people who came to church today because their family's coming. And they're just as rational. They're just as intelligent. And what they would be convinced of is it's just a story. They'd be just as convinced that, hey, you know what, that may have happened long ago, I don't know, but it really doesn't affect my life today. People are convinced of that. There would be people here today who are convinced that Jesus is who he says he is. And there would be people uh, that are here today who are just as convinced Jesus is a story. And what I would tell you is when it comes to Easter, when it comes to to Jesus, the stakes are way too high to not know the truth. And so over the next few minutes today, again, I'm going to present some facts of the Easter story. I'm going to present the truth today. But I want to tell you something. I I believe, but I'm not going to present the facts as Mike Fackler. I'm I'm not going to try to convince you by my words. I'm going to present the case for Christ based on God's word himself. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit will speak to people's hearts and minds. And by the time we are done today, I believe people who will be convinced for the very first time that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Not based on anything I would say because I'm going to tell you something. Spoiler alert. I don't have the ability to convince anybody in here. But the one who came, the one who conquered, the one who rose from the dead... He still speaks, and he's got the ability, and I promise you, you're going to hear his voice today. You're going to hear his voice today. So let's just get right to it. Let's get right to it, and let's get right to the facts. It is a historical fact. It is a historical fact that Jesus Christ was crucified. That is a historical uh, fact. Now, the burden of proof, going all the way back to Bible times, especially if you're in law enforcement, especially if you're like, no, I need to believe. It is a historical fact. The burden of truth had to be at least two eyewitnesses. It is a historical fact that Jesus Christ was crucified. The burden of proof has been met, and it has been met with a resounding bell. You see, the Romans were there. The Romans didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't give two cents about Jesus. To the Romans, he's just another rabble rouser. He's just another riot causer. But the Romans were there. They don't believe he's the son of God. He's just some religious guy. And they would tell you, we killed that guy. And they're good at what they do. You know who else would have been there? The Jews were there. You see, the the Jews, the people, they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God either. But the Jews were there. People didn't even believe in him. And they were there, and they would tell you, no, the Romans killed that guy. We were there. Like, we saw it. We could hear it. Everything about, we were there. Jesus is dead. I'll tell you who else was there. The disciples were there. They saw it. They saw the crucifixion. And lastly, Jesus was there. All four of those people and all four of those people groups would have said, Jesus has been crucified. Jesus himself would tell you he's got evidence. I mean, he's got evidence in his hands. He's got evidence in his side. He would say, they crucified me. They killed me. That's the burden of proof. But the stories would be a little bit different. You see, the Romans would say, we killed him. Because he started riots, because he was making our life miserable. 
The Jews would say, man, we don't like what he was preaching. We don't like what he was teaching. We don't like what he was saying. He was causing people to believe new things that are different than what we've been teaching. He's a religious rabble rouser. We're going to kill him. That's what they would say. So we would all be wise to listen to what Jesus himself had to say. Listen to what he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now let's just look at what Jesus is saying. He is actually saying this well before he ever goes to the cross. He's telling us what's going to happen. He's like, I didn't come here for, you, for, for uh, you to serve me. I came to serve you and to give my life as a ransom. So let's just unpack this for a, for a second. If you look at back at every cult, if you look back at every cult, every crazy religious thing, the leader is always trying to get other people to serve who? Them. But here Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to, uh, to, uh, for you to serve me. I've actually come to serve you. And to give my life as a ransom. Now look at that word ransom for a second. A ransom is something that you pay to set someone free. A ransom is what is offered to free the captives. You guys with me? I'm just going to tell you something. Based on Jesus' own words, based on Jesus' own teaching, something rings different because somebody is giving their life is a ransom for somebody else. Now that sounds like love to me. And what I would tell you is if you walked in here today and you're convinced that Jesus Christ isn't real, even this group of people would say, I believe God is real. And you would even believe with me, and this isn't, this, you, would, you would agree with this, you would say that God is love. Well, isn't what Jesus Christ is saying right here, isn't that a kind of love that you would give God credit for? And he's like, I'll give my life as a ransom. Well, who's he giving his life as a ransom for? That's fascinating. Well, again, the cross, what happened around Easter tells us this. You can turn in your Bibles and you can look with me. You can look with me. I think it's Mark chapter 15, 34. Mark 15, 34, and this is what Jesus says while he's on the cross. He says, my God, my God, or he goes, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, why have you forsaken me? That's a fascinating question, isn't it? Now, here's what you need to know about Jesus. There has never been a moment that he has been separated from the Father. In his entire existence, there has never been a moment he, is se he has been separated from his Father until now. Why is Jesus, like, and so th I just want to ask this question. Who is Jesus giving his life as a ransom for? But I also want to ask this. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want to ask a question. Why did God forsake him? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Why did God forsake him? Let me answer that for you. Because God, because God was in the business of doing a miracle in that moment unlike the world had ever seen. There was a miracle taking place in that moment for you and me. Jesus was giving his life as a ransom. Here's what God was doing. When Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? Because God's doing a miracle. And here's the miracle work that he did. He took all of our sin. He took every lie that I've ever told. He took every wicked thought I've ever thought or will think again. He took every sin in Mike Fackler's life. He took every sin in your life and he miraculously took it off of our lives and he placed it on his son Jesus' shoulders and he allowed Christ to be the ransom for our sins. Jesus, your, my son, God says, will pay the ransom for your penalties. And he put the penalty of those sin, which is death, and he miraculously transposed it. He did a miracle and he transferred it to his son. And that's why God forsook him. Now this may not sound familiar to you, but let me remind you. 
the Old Testament and the New Testament weave together to tell the whole story. When is the last time God separated himself from people because of sin? You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve sinned and God distanced himself. He pulled away from, and here at the moment on the cross, God removes his presence from his son. Why? Because his son is carrying our sin to ransom your life and my life. But if you look at the words, if you look at what Jesus says, even more clearly, I'm going to show you something that you may have never seen before. It's powerful. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus has been hanging on the cross. His wrists and his feet have been pierced by nails. For the past few, give it, he was on the cross for three hours. Towards the end of that three hours, he had been suffocating, doing everything he could through excruciating pain to try to prolong life. And what is he crying out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In saying that phrase, in the time it took Jesus to utter that phrase, he reveals a truth that each and every one of us better pay attention to. Because what he is saying is, it is more awful to be separated from you, God, than to be on this cross. It is more excruciating to be separated from you, God, than to be right here. This, this hurts. This is awful. This is suffering. This is torture. But being apart from you is hell. And he was only apart from God for just a couple days. He was only apart from, from God the Father for a couple seconds before he utters this. God has removed himself, and the first thing Jesus does is he says, My God, my God, where are you? I've always been with you. Where are you? That was worse than the cross. And what he's telling us is any existence apart from God is hell. Now, some of you are convinced it's just a story. You're like, well, I don't really have a relationship with God. My life's not altogether that bad. There's a reason for that. And I'm going to tell you what it is in just a couple of minutes. Pay attention. Somebody who knew God his entire life was separated from a few moments, and it was more than he could bear. What I'm telling you is you don't want to risk eternity apart from God. Because if the son of God was apart from him for a couple seconds, he's like, this is too much. You don't want an eternity apart from the God who made you and who loved you. But that's, and that's why Jesus went to the cross. To ransom you from that experience. To save you from yourself. To save you from that. I'm telling you, man, God is good. God is love. And, and I believe, and I believe, I believe this with all I am. I believe God's going to convince you of some of this. Now the disciples were there. And they were convinced the emotion of the moment, just the sheer volume, just, just taking it in was one of those moments that was more than anybody could stand. It was like being in one of those moments that's going to scar you, that's going to shape you for your entire life. You're going to feel things you never felt before. You're going to see things you never saw before. It is gruesome. And that's what they're experiencing they're totally, listen, they're totally blinded to what is happening in front of them because they're so overwhelmed with what's happening in front of them. Jesus is communicating truth, but what they're seeing, what they're believing, what they're convinced of is so overwhelming, they're missing it. And what I want to let you know is that is way more spiritual in nature than you can possibly imagine. Because evil is every bit as real as you are. Evil is every bit as real as God is. But let me tell you another fact about evil. It's not as powerful as God is. God is stronger. Because I am going to show you, see, there is a fact that they were blinded for a reason. 
And today, if you walked in here, and this is part of the Easter story we can all relate to. If you walked in and you're convinced that this is just a story and you're convinced this is just, you know, hey, something we do on Easter, I'm telling you, there's a reason for that. And it's more spiritual in nature. You see Jesus, or Paul, talks to the Corinthian church in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, the God of this age. Now, when you read the Bible and you see the little g, that's not talking about the big g. That's not talking about God. That's talking about somebody other than. And what he's talking about, what he's referring to, is he's referring to the devil, the God of this age, the worldly God, the enemy. His name is Lucifer. His, enemy, his name is the devil. His name is Satan. That's who he's talking about. He says, the devil has blinded the minds of who? He has blinded the minds of people who are convinced that Jesus isn't real. He has blinded the minds at the moment of the disciples. That is real. That is an authority. The devil has that type of authority. He can blind people. It says it right here. It says it in the Bible. The enemy has blinded the minds of who? So that they cannot see the light of the gospel. So that they cannot see the truth. So that they cannot see the reality of Jesus Christ. So that they cannot see the totality of Easter that displays the glory of Christ who is the very image of God. You see, the enemy has been convincing some people here today for so long that this is just a story, that man, that, that this is just something you do. It's a religious thing. He's been convincing you. He's been doing that forever. And this is how he does it. I'm going to tell you his playbook right here, and I bet you probably, some of you guys are going to see yourself in the playbook. In fact, everybody in here will see yourself in the playbook at one time or another. And he hates the fact I'm telling you this, but the reason I'm telling you this is to just prove the principle that God is stronger than the lie, that love is stronger than the lie. Here is his playbook. Some of you have been blessed with a really good life. In fact, I would say many of us have been blessed with a really good life. In fact, there may be so many many hardships that you haven't had to endure. What I would tell you is the enemy has blinded you. You would say, hey, my life is good. Why on earth would I need Jesus? And what I would tell you is you're just buying into a lie that the enemy's been telling for a long time. That's part of his playbook. Let me tell you another lie that he loves to tell. Some of you, and when I tell you this, I don't know you. I may not know you personally. I may not know your story the way you do. But I would dare venture there is at least one person in here whose life has been a living hell. That every day, just to get through it, is hard as fire. It's just tougher than anybody in here could possibly imagine, and it's happened through no fault of your own. Maybe you were abandoned as a kid. Maybe you were abused as a kid. And somebody's got that story, and it's awful. And the lie that the devil would tell you is, is that if God was love, and if God was real, he wouldn't let you happen. That, he wouldn't let that happen to you. And so you're convinced God doesn't love you. You're convinced that God isn't real, because if he was love and he was real, he wouldn't let that happen to you. And what I'm telling you is if that's your story, the enemy's been telling you a lie. Another lie the enemy loves to deceive us with, to blind us so that we can't see the truth of of, uh, Easter, truth of Jesus. And he's convinced people with this, is that he convinces us with shame. If other people would look at us and call us an abomination, like we're so screwed up, we got so many scars, we got so many bad habits, there's no way, the lie he tells, there's no way. If, If people don't love you, why would God love you? And I would tell you that it's just another lie the enemy uses. And if he's telling you that, I'm telling you something. The enemy, if you're convinced because of that, the enemy is behind that lie. And today, the Lord wants to take the blinders off. He wants to heal you. Will you let him? Let me tell you another way that he blinds us. You'll love this one. Okay, Christian. You say Jesus is the only way to heaven. You take your way and I'll take my way because I believe and I'm convinced there are many ways to. Man, doesn't our society believe that? Doesn't our society believe that, man, hey, if I'm good enough, I'm going to heaven. Doesn't people, do, people believe that, right? Somebody just nod to me so I know I'm not crazy. Okay, cool. People believe that, that there are many ways to heaven. Let me tell you something. That is literally, that is literally, oh man, people are going to see. Thank you, Lord. That is literally the oldest lie in the book. 
What do you mean, Mike Fackler? Well, if you go back to Genesis, if you go back to the very first human beings, Adam and Eve, if you go back to the very first ones, God told them that they should not eat of a certain tree or they would. He said, don't eat of this tree or you're going to. And the enemy, the devil came and he lied to them. And they said, surely you won't. There are many ways to heaven. It's just the same old lie with a new twist to it. Because what the enemy is blinding you with, he's saying, hey, you're not going to die. There's a whole lot of different ways to get to heaven. It's the same lie he's been telling. Listen, you guys, we're all in Wyoming, man. You love the outdoors. I know that there's hunters in here. There is not a better hunter. There is not a more skilled hunter than the enemy. He knows how to trick. He knows how to deceive. And I'm going to tell you something. You buy his lie, he'll kill you. There's not a better hunter. But there is not a better liberator. There is not a better freedom fighter. There is not anybody more powerful than Jesus Christ because he came to let the blind see. And this morning, I believe he wants to help you see. And he wants to do that because he gave his life as a ransom for you. And he wants to set you free. And he wants you to see. You see, three days after Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Something miraculous happened. A new day dawned. And as a new day dawned, love broke through. And love broke out. And the Christ that they had crucified, the crucified Christ, walked out of that tomb, the world's risen Savior. I wasn't there. But let me tell you something. The Romans were there. The same ones who killed him were guarding his tomb. And you want to know what they would say? While they would not be able to articulate it this way, they would say something happened. Something so overwhelming, something not of this world, something way more powerful than us. And they were the fiercest, most powerful people on the planet. These are not men you would trifle with. These are not men you would jack with. And something more powerful than them rolled that stone away. And what these people who don't believe in God would tell you is, I was guarding a tomb that he was in, and when I looked in there, he wasn't there anymore. You see, his followers, Mary and Mary, what they would tell you is, we ran, we felt the earthquake, we walked to the tomb, we saw the angels, the angels talked to us, we looked inside of there, and he's not there. And you know who else would say that? Jesus would say that. He says, I was in there and I was dead. Listen, Jesus wasn't walking around in a tomb for three days thinking, wow, I'm getting a little bit hungry. It's time to come out. They had beat him within an inch of his life and then they had crucified him and they had speared him. He physically didn't have the strength. He was dead. And now he's alive. And where were the disciples, by the way? They were hiding. They were blinded by fear. Turn in your Bibles real quick. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Turn in your Bibles with me. To John chapter 20, verse 19. It, was, see, it wasn't the morning that Jesus rose from the dead. It is now on the evening of that first day when Jesus rose from the dead. When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They see what the Jews did to Jesus. They're scared to death. The Jews are going to do it to them too. So they're what? They're hiding and they're hiding in fear. Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, dead people don't talk. And it wasn't one of those moments where the door started rattling and everybody's attention turned to the screen like you're watching a movie. Jesus was all of a sudden, boom, here I am. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side where the nails had been and where the spear had been. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Now listen, the disciples are up there. They're hiding because they're convinced that Jesus is dead. Contrary to the fact that Jesus said it would happen, contrary to the fact that Jesus told him that he would rise from the dead, contrary to the fact that the women said, hey, we saw Jesus this morning, contrary to all of this, they're hiding because they're convinced that Jesus is dead. And I know that some of you today are convinced Jesus is dead, but here Jesus is 
talking with his disciples. And I would tell you, dead people don't talk. Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The same spirit, the same power that rose me from the dead, receive it. If you forgive any of his sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive him, they are not forgiven. Now listen to this in verse 24. Now Thomas, who was one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus appeared. Listen, if a guy who you saw was crucified, who you saw go into the tomb, if you were convinced he was dead and then you physically saw him and he he was talking to you, and you could feel his breath on your face. What do you think you're doing about that? You're telling somebody. And the first one they tell is Thomas. They're like, dude, you missed out. We were here, and we were freaking out, and all of a sudden, Jesus is in the room. We felt his breath. We heard his words. He's not dead. He's alive. And Thomas is like, no way. He's convinced. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in the hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. Listen to this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them this time. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Same place. Same time. Same room. But this time Thomas is there and Jesus starts again, peace be with you. Thomas's eyes are probably doing this right now. But it gets even better. Then Jesus said to Thomas, he didn't address Peter. He's like, hey, Peter, good to see you again. He didn't tell James and John, hey, what's for dinner tonight? He looked at the one guy who was still convinced he was dead. And what are the first words he said to him? He said the very words, the reason that Thomas was convinced he was dead, he addressed that issue with Thomas. He's like, Thomas, I know you think I'm dead. I want you to come and put your hand in here. You see, the biggest guy in the room who was a skeptic, the biggest skeptic of all, put his fingers where the nails were, put his hands where the side, or put his hands in the side where the spear had been. Jesus loved him so much. He wasn't angry about this. He's like, Thomas, I get it. You're doubting. You're convinced I'm not real. Come and do this. And then what does Thomas do in verse 28? He drops and he says, my Lord and my God. Now listen to this because this is important for all of us. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. This is for everybody in here. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those who were not there and they believe. Blessed is a really big word. It's a church word, but let me just make it really simple for you. It's God's favor. Being blessed is to be favored by God. And I'm going to tell you something. Each and every one of us in here are blessed. We have been blessed by God because God's love is for all of us. He sent Jesus for all of us. He rose Jesus in the, from the dead for all of us. We've all been blessed. But not everybody, has, not everybody has received that blessing. Not everybody's living in that blessing because there are some here today who are convinced that this isn't real. And I remind you, I'm not pointing the facts out according to me. I'm pointing the facts out according to God. And what I would tell you is Jesus said, blessed are those who believe. You see, in our lives, wrapping this thing up, we want to believe based on what we can see, feel, taste, smell, touch, all that stuff. All of our five senses. But Jesus is asking us to go a step further. To receive that blessing, to live in that blessing, he's asking each and every one of us to take a step of faith. I want you to move beyond what you can see, and I want you to take a step of faith. A step of faith is to believe is to trust, and it's to obey. And Jesus is inviting us to do that today. By the way, the disciples believe. They chose to live in that blessing. And under threat of death of their own life, when the executioner was at hand said, recant or I'll kill you, they said, I can't. I can't. Why'd they say that? Because they were convinced that Jesus Christ was real. Now, if that was just a religious thing, they'd have been like, you bet, man. Hey, so sorry. Just kidding. Can I go now? But they're like, no way. 
Absolutely no way. I saw Jesus crucified. I saw him risen. What I'm saying is true. Whether you choose to believe me or not, I'm convinced. Why? Because they were eyewitnesses. They believed. And this morning, you have a chance to believe too. But it'll take a step of faith.